What do Henry Ford, Walt Disney, and Albert Einstein have in common? Let's add a few to the list. How about Hans Christian Andersen, the Wright brothers, and Steve Jobs? If you answered that they were all wildly successful people who had a tremendous impact on the world, you're right. But you're only half right. They were all also dyslexic. And they accomplished great things not despite their dyslexia, but at least in part because of it. What you think you know about dyslexia, in fact, may very well be wrong. So today we're diving in. Is your child dyslexic? And if so, what does that mean? And what should you do about it? All of this and more right here on the Read Aloud Revival. You're listening to the Read Aloud Revival podcast. I'm your host, Sarah McKenzie, homeschooling mama of six and author of The Read Aloud Family and Teaching from Rest. As parents, we're overwhelmed with a lot to do. It feels like every child needs something different. The good news is you are the best person to help your kids learn and grow, and home is the best place to fall in love with books. This podcast has been downloaded 7 million times in over 160 countries. So if you want to nurture warm relationships while also raising kids who love to read, you're in good company. We'll help your kids fall in love with books and we'll help you fall in love with homeschooling. Let's get started. Dyslexia. It's one of the things we're asked about most here at Read Aloud Revival, and it's no wonder. Dr. Sally Shaywitz, co-director of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, estimates that 80 to 90 percent of children who struggle with learning disorders have dyslexia. That's as many as one in five children. Also, dyslexia is highly genetic, which means if one of your kids struggles with dyslexia, it's pretty likely that another one may as well. Today, we're going to talk about the signs of dyslexia, how to spot it, and what to do if you're pretty sure your child is indeed dyslexic. In order to do that, we're going to talk to someone who knows. So I called in Marianne Sunderland. And trust me, Marianne knows. Seven of her eight children are dyslexic, and she's become a passionate and educated advocate. She runs the website homeschoolingwithdyslexia.com, and she authored the book I recommend you read first if you suspect dyslexia in your home. It's called Dyslexia 101 by Marianne Sunderland. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. There are a lot of misconceptions about what dyslexia is, so I asked Marianne to start our conversation by describing dyslexia to us so we have a better understanding right from the get-go. There's a lot of misunderstandings about dyslexia, but at its core, it's inherited brain wiring difference that affects a person's language acquisition skills. So it's inherited, it's genetic. It's caused by a difference in brain wiring. And the weakness that you see is difficulty with the language. It could be with the written word. It could be hearing. It's processing delays or processing lags. In the 1990s, Sally Shaywitz and her team at Stanford, they did a test or they they did functional MRIs on the brains of good readers and not so good readers. And they found that in the not so good readers, the impulse went from the eye with 20-20 vision, the good readers, it went straight to the reading center of the brain. But the not so good readers, the path was much more convoluted. And so they discovered then that it really was just a brain wiring difference. And But what's cool about dyslexia and what they're finding out more and more now is a lot of the strengths that are associated with On the flip side of that weakness, where say they're not very detail oriented, they can also tend to be entrepreneurial or inventive engineering, like some of the famous names that you mentioned in the intro. This is a strength of dyslexia. And so it's kind of cool. Like now people are starting to look at dyslexia. Yeah, it's tough when they're learning to read and write, but as they get older, you know, they're all full of surprises. (laughs) 
Yeah, I think for, I mean, at least for me, for so long, I thought of dyslexia as a learning disorder, but it feels like what you're describing is more just of a learning difference. Like there's nothing wrong with a dyslexic brain. It's just wired differently than a non-dyslexic brain. Yes. One of the myths about dyslexia is that it's just low IQ. You know, whenever you see someone who's not spelling well, your first instinct is, oh, well, they can't spell, right? They're not that smart or whatever, but actually they almost always have average to above average intelligence. So it's not a true disability in the sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes sense because I think in your book, Dyslexia 101, that was one of the things you mentioned was you have this bright child who can engage in conversation and is otherwise, you know, is very bright. And yet they struggle so much with these language processing, which shows up as having a hard time, maybe learning to read or struggling to spell or write. And so then that's sort of the red flag. What are the warning signs? What should we be watching for that could be an indication that our child might be dyslexic? So you can Google lists and there's lists on my website, but essentially you're going to see like an otherwise bright child struggling to master just the concepts of reading. So they may have trouble remembering their sounds, just the basic sounds, especially vowels. Vowels can be especially I and E, short I and short E. Those are very similar. So you'll see that you'll always see difficulties with spelling. Now, a lot of kids struggle or they'll spell phonetically while they're young, but after a couple of years of instruction, they should be learning more how to you know, remember sight words and so forth. So as a child gets older, you'll see reversals beyond first grade. So they're reversing their B's and their D's and their P's and their Q's and whatever, and lots of other things. But some other things that you don't always recognize or you may not realize is things like tying shoes. Very difficult for kids with dyslexia. Rhyming is a big one. So being able to pick words that rhyme is always difficult. Prepositions like up and down or yesterday and tomorrow or, you know, they have a really hard, I mean, my 17 year old the other day got yesterday and tomorrow mixed up you know, cause she just wasn't thinking. It just kind of came out. So, so directions can be hard for them. So there's, there's lots of little things. And then when they're reading, you'll see them guessing a lot. So whereas a child with some phonics instruction is being taught, you know, to sound things out, they're kind of looking at the shape, they're using context. They're like, well, it starts with a P, you know, and they kind of guess. They'll also skip small words and sentences. And you'll see things like a sight word, like the, They'll see it in a sentence and you'll say, well, that's the word the, you know, and then on the next line, when the comes up again, they're just, it's like they never saw it before. So you're laughing. At I'm you nodding. Possibly. Our listeners can't see me nodding vigorously over here, but because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because when I first realized that one of our kids was dyslexic and now I'm realizing I more recently have realized that several of our children are dyslexic. The first time I realized it, and I was looking at this list of possible warning signs and one of them said something about calendars and sequential time being a difficult thing to learn. And I know with one of my kids, I mean, I really thought this child will never, ever, ever learn the 12 months of the year. Never. Like we can go over it. It does not matter how many times we go over it. And then of course you're saying, you know, the vowel sounds. And I just had a reading lesson this morning, but I just thought, wow, this is okay. I just read, reread Dyslexia 101. So I am, I am feeling very energized and optimistic, (laughs) (laughs) but otherwise I would have gone, oh my goodness, I cannot believe we're still doing this. (laughs) Yeah. And it's very common that that's why it's so good to just like you, you read the book and you're like, okay, these things are normal because our kids are really trying hard. And one of the pitfalls of a child with dyslexia being in school, like a, a traditional school setting is that teachers really aren't trained to understand dyslexia. It's no fault of theirs. It's just how education is designed, but they're often misunderstood you know, they look lazy or like they're not trying or not paying attention. And the irony is, is they're really trying harder than any other kid. They're really, really trying to remember. They're trying to focus. Uh, A lot of kids with dyslexia also have some kind of focus struggle, whether it's ADD or ADHD, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60% of kids, you know, with dyslexia will struggle with that too. So they have, it's so important to to just understand and be gracious. And uh, we can talk more about that, but having homeschooled eight kids to read now and seven of them were dyslexic. There's a special seat for you in heaven, I think. (laughs) (laughs) When my one non-dyslexic kid learned to read from Explode the Code, I I seriously went in my room and just cried a little bit. I was like, oh my gosh. 
<laughs> yeah. I hear other people say, you know, my child just taught themselves how to read. That's what my mom says about me. In fact, and I don't remember learning how to read at all. And I thought maybe out of six, I'd get one that could teach themselves how to read, but that didn't happen for me. <laughs> right? Yes. And so that's how a lot of kids learn to read. You just give them a little instruction, a reading rich environment, read to them, right? And they learn to read. And I actually really thought I was hard on myself. I thought I was doing things wrong. And especially because my oldest was dyslexic and we had just started homeschooling, you know, I got a lot of flack from well-meaning family, like maybe you should put him in school. And it was like, maybe I should, but can I share a story? Is this? Please. Okay. Yes. Okay. So when my oldest son was 10 or is he nine, nine or 10, and we had four kids, we took a three-year sailing trip. So we rented out our house to some friends from church and we went sailing for three years. And it was funny because I really wanted to stay back and do like reading tutoring. And my husband, who's dyslexic, was like, eh, I learned to read. He's fine. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> but the people who rented our house had kids, our kids' ages, and they went to the local public school. And lo and behold, their oldest daughter had dyslexia and she was ridiculed in class. Like you would think, I mean, we live in a fairly like upper middle class, you know, educated area, you know, but this teacher came in and she, it would make her read in front of the class and then embarrass her. And oh, the te- she was ridiculed by the teacher, by the not even teacher. by the students. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we came back and, you know, I had still had that thought because we were still trying to teach him to read, you know, while we we're out there. But, you know, I was like, okay, maybe schools don't have all the answers, you know, and it kind of was like one little bit of info at a time, you know, to keep me on the path that we went on. And so now I'm here to say, hey, this is how it works, you know. <laughs> I mean, every homeschool parent, I think at one time or another goes, am I ruining my kids? Am I actually destroying their education by trying to do this myself? And first of all, that's such a normal feeling. We all feel that way, although we don't talk about it often enough, I think. But then to hear, we do tend to have that default of they would probably get a better education if it wasn't me teaching. So for you to get have that experience where you found that actually what you were able to give your son at home was better than he might have gotten at school, very likely in this situation, is really encouraging, I think, for a lot of us to go, okay. It really was. It, it really gave me just enough strength to keep going. And I think that was, we got back when he was 12 and he learned to read that year. We used a great illustrated classics. Do you know what those are? You get them off eBay and stuff where they have like big print and a picture on every other page. And um, someone said to me once, I'm glad my kid was still dyslexic because they didn't read a bunch of junk. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's right. They ba- they bypass a lot of the <laughs> a lot of the stuff you don't really want them to read. Yeah, it takes them so long to read. You know, they just they <laughs> like I, my library is sufficient. They don't have to scour, you know, the Thousand Oaks library. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to get into, in this episode, I'd love to just get into a few more nuts and bolts for people who are listening who think, wait a second, I think it's possible that one of my kids is dyslexic or maybe more than one of my kids is dyslexic. And what I found, first of all, listeners, I want to highly, highly recommend Marianne's book, Dyslexia 101. It's a quick read. I mean, I know as a busy mom, if I see a big old tome (laughs) that's like going to take me a long time to get through, I feel like it's one more thing to my to-do list. But I would suggest Dyslexia 101 as the first place you should go if you suspect dyslexia in your kids because it's quick, you can read it in an evening, it's practical, and it's encouraging. So whether or not you're thinking of your four-year-old, your eight-year-old, your 12-year-old, or your 16-year-old right now as we're talking, this book is going to have some tools for you, next steps, and some encouragement along the way. And actually, that kind of leads me into my next question, Marianne, which is, do kids grow out of dyslexia? And can we talk about the genetic component for just a minute? No, kids don't outgrow it and they are not cured of it. So if you ever read something that says, you know, we'll cure your child of dyslexia, run. Because it's it's not a matter of being cured. It's a matter of just being taught systematically how to read. And so 
Now, my oldest son, I, I didn't use any Orton Gillingham or a, a dyslexia approved curriculum. I used probably everything else, but I didn't use that because I didn't know it existed. But he, you know, he learned to read. So all kids can learn to read. And the the genetic part of it is, I don't know, I think it's dominant <laughs> because of my eight kids, seven are dyslexic. Yeah. Yeah. And dyslexic. I think probably out of my six. I'm pretty confident that four are dyslexic. I know for sure that two are pretty strongly dyslexic and maybe five. I mean, I mean like, I'm not really sure. You know, I know that there, you mentioned this in your book, that there is very, there are varying degrees. Degrees. Thank you. Yeah. I was looking for the word, couldn't find it. <laughs> varying degrees of dyslexia. Yeah. So, so a lot of people who are more mildly dyslexic will get by in school, but it's very difficult. And so those people tend to feel like they're stupid. Like, why is it so easy for everybody else? It's hard for me. I have all the whole range. I have a couple severely or profoundly dyslexic kids. One of them is 23 now, and he's wildly successful. Took his college fund and invested it. Started a business. You can't even keep up with the kid. He's just like, so he has such a vision. And you know the thing? Oh my goodness. All through school, he was so social. And I kept being like, sit down, pay attention. You know, like you have, to, you have to write this essay. You have to compare Shakespeare to love in the Bible, you know, or you know, that poor kid, you know. Firstborns, they're resilient because they have to be the guinea pigs for all of us, right? Yes, I did a, I did a dyslexia simulation. I have one on my website during my, I was trained as a dyslexia tutor. And I did this simulation and he, we have a, like an office school room and I, he was behind me in the office and I just, I was crying and I just looked at him. I was like, I am so sorry. <laughs> like I had no idea because he'd be bored and I'd be like, read a book. Cause that's what I used to do as a kid, you know? And I didn't realize like, it's really hard for kids with dyslexia to read and adults with dyslexia, they can learn to read. You know, it doesn't go away. They probably will prefer things like audiobooks or podcasts or YouTube or things like that to learn. Although some become avid readers, it just depends on the person. Well, that's one of the gifts of audiobooks, I think. I mean, I tell the story often of my son when we would do quiet reading time in the afternoon and I would send a couple of my, you know, all my kids to go read in their rooms, but he wasn't reading on his own yet. So he just devoured the Redwall series on audio. And what happens, I found this so often by talking to other parents too. And I'm wondering if this is your experience, Marianne, that these kids who are later readers because they're dyslexic, who have gotten a lot of audiobooks, have all this really good language inside of them. They've heard all this good language. So once they start reading, it's not like it takes the same amount of time to get from frog and toad to Robinson Crusoe or whatever, you know, there's a shorter line between those two things. Mm -hmm. It's very true. I used to call it, well, I still kind of call it middle school magic. Like it doesn't matter what you do with your kid by middle school, they'll be reading like the penny drops, you know, and I'm reading this book on unschooling and I'm thinking, have I been spinning my wheels this whole time? Like, should I have just waited <laughs> and gone to the park? But yes. So they catch up really quickly. My oldest, I mean, he excelled in English in high school and I, that was this class I was the most worried about, but his vocabulary was off the charts because he would listen to books that like I couldn't even follow, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings series. And I was like, wait, who's that? And what's that person? And where's that? You know, and, and he's just like boop, 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 processing all of this information and building pictures in his head and this is making me think because I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as homeschooling parents to give our kids everything they're going to need to succeed, right? Like like whether or not we do a good job or not is going to be the trajectory, impact the trajectory of their life. And to some degree, of course, that's true. But I was just thinking about this the other day because my oldest is a freshman in college. Actually, she's a sophomore now. She just she finished her freshman year a little early. We never really did a grammar program. Well, fast forward now, and here she is, an English major with a concentration in editing and publishing. You know, even just when she graduated, she was still, I'm sorry, Audrey, I'm totally telling on you in this episode, and you're going to hear it, I'm sure. She was using commas, like cupcake sprinkles is what I always thought of it. You know, like she would write 
this beautiful essay. So one, like a really good essay. And then I think she would look at it and go, well, there should probably be some commas in here and I don't know how to use them. So I don't know where they should go, you know? So she'd kind of sprinkle them throughout. So the summer between her graduation and college, she did one of those really skinny workbook things. that's just like commas. I mean, I can't even remember what brand it was. It doesn't even matter. It was just one of those little workbooks. That's like how to use commas. She did it in like, I don't know, a week or something on her own. And now she can use commas and she's doing just fine. So it's like one of those things where we kind of think we have to slave over all this curriculum for years and years and years to make sure our kids get it. And that's not always the case. It's not at all. I have seen something with, so four of my kids are adults now and my 22 year old, she's a senior in college, more mildly dyslexic, some ADD and getting her to do math in college or in high school was like, I mean, I, I signed her up for a tutor and she'd come out of her room and be like, I don't want to go. I didn't do my homework. And I was like, you get in that car and you go to that tutor or you're paying for it. You know, so she'd be like, oh, okay. And so off she went. <laughs> I mean, it got that bad. It was just like, oh my goodness, you know. Anyway, so she got through algebra in her senior year of high school and went on to college. And doesn't she decide to be a kinesiology major and she needs all this math? But she was working at a physical therapist's office and like she'd been involved in dance and sports and stuff. And so she really wanted to be a physical therapist. And good grades were important, you know, because it's hard to get into the programs. And that kid went through, I think she took the placement test and needed to do like algebra again. So she took algebra and advanced algebra and trigonometry or something and pre-calc and statistics and aced them all. And I was like, huh, that's interesting because I couldn't barely get you to do enough math to graduate from high school. But it was all motivation. It was all internal motivation, right? Yes. Not anything you couldn't have done for her, actually. No, I could not have. And so I really, it really, I've seen it in all of my adult kids. Just when they find their thing, they just take off. And so I have really been able to back off big time on my fear of not teaching commas or missing a period of history or like they just, my boys are like medieval, medieval. I'm like, we should really study U.S. history. No, medieval, medieval. But I don't worry anymore because I mean, like, I know this is sort of cliche, but if you raise your kids to like to learn, they're always going to be learning. And all of my adult kids for all of my failures, and there were many, are lifelong learners. Okay. So I think one of the fears that I have had you know, especially when I first had those first thoughts of, I think maybe my kids or a certain child or any of my kids might be dyslexic. And I was worried that they wouldn't love reading because of course I want my kids to love reading. So how can dyslexia impact a child's love of reading as far as you can tell? Well, really it has nothing to do with reading. It has to do with their teacher. So I was just reading, I don't know, I read a lot but I think it was in my unschooling book, this unschooled by Carrie McDonald. She was talking about, you know, a boy in school and he's in, I don't know, second grade and he's labeled behind and he's getting assignments and school became, kind, or reading became kind of a, a chore and almost a punishment and you have to read before you can do anything fun. And that's the surest way to get your kids to hate reading. And kids with dyslexia, like they do really well with graphic novels and things like that. So in comes like dog man, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, there's all these, like they're cute little graphic novels. And I was just like, okay, well, they'll just hurry and get through that. You know, <laughs> we'll get through that phase really quickly and get on to the good stuff, you know? And my 13 year old just said to me, I don't know why you're making me read these chapter books. Like, I just really like the graphic novels, you know, and I'm, and I'm like thinking, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, like you can kind of project your worry onto your kids. And so how I have helped my kids to not feel that is to, I do believe that it's important to use a good reading program. And I do believe it's important to start 
when they're school age, maybe six, five, six, seven, whatever you choose to do, whatever suits, you know, your particular homeschool style, use a program that works in Orton Gillingham program. It's like all about reading and all about spelling, Barton, Logic of English. Those three are really good. They're open and go pretty much. So just do them consistently three times a week and make it fun. And if you have to review the same thing over and over again, just do it. They will learn to read. And so just not stressing about it is super, super important. And then most dyslexic kids love a good story. So if you're reading, I mean, even my older kids will come and sit in the living room. You probably said this a thousand times, but they'll come out when I'm reading, you know, I remember like Redwall was a family favorite. They'll come out and listen. And so that's, that's another way. I remember when one of my daughters, she's 17 now, she's a writing type. Like she loves to write very good with words. And she started listening to series of books from the library. And her, I, I remember her just walking out of her room and being like, like, <laughs> like the characters, I can't remember the name of the series. It was like these animals. And I don't know if you mentioned it, I would remember, but she was absolutely blown away at the characters and the plot twists and the, uh, Loving to actually physically read is very different from loving stories. What we really want our kids that love stories and can read, right? <laughs> yeah. So I basically, I have loads and loads of books all around the house that are readable. And I do require some quiet reading time, but I don't really say what they have to read. They can do whatever they want, but they often ends up being longer because they get into whatever they're doing. So but letting them follow their interests. I've heard of kids, you know, who are real into sports. So their parents would get magazines for them or something so that they could read the stats. But following interests is huge. Absolutely huge. My second oldest daughter taught herself to read. You know, I'd given her some instruction, but she was struggling, but she loved animals. And, you know, she was number two of many So we go to the library and get all the books and come back home and I could read a little bit, but I didn't really have time to really dedicate to one kid's interests, you know, have it be like history or science or something. But she, she would sit down with those books and she taught, basically cracked the code of reading because she wanted the information. And once again, we're back at that internal motivation, right? Because she wanted to get it for herself. Yeah. So I really, really encourage parents not to stress. Your kids will read. I'm not a full-on unschooler. I wouldn't really recommend not teaching them. I think it's important to have some instruction and that reading-rich environment and limiting screen time and stuff like that. But yeah. We'll get into a little bit more on the details of those Orton Gillingham methods and why that works in our next episode, because I told you, I, uh, listeners, I told you, I, I'm so interested in this topic. And I know so many of you are interested that we're doing two episodes on dyslexia. So, but I do want to read just underline the programs she mentioned, because I know a lot of you are going to be going and looking for some. So all about reading logic of English. And those are the two that I've used. So those are the ones that stuck out to me, but Marianne, what was another? Barton. Susan Barton's reading program. Yes. Excellent. And you know, it's interesting because my, the first time I, I thought, you know, I think I have a kid who, who's dyslexic. I think we're, I don't think he's going to learn reading the same way that I expected him to learn to read. I had tried all these different reading programs and he was nine. Let me think he was about nine. He might've been a little like eight and a half or something when I moved over to all about reading and didn't know that it was because it was Orton Gillingham or that it's especially good for dyslexic kids or anything. But that's the program. I mean, he was in the middle of all about reading level three and he went from reading Frog and Toad to reading these really long novels, (laughs) like in this really short amount of time. And I remember thinking this program is magic and now I know why. (laughs) And now whenever anyone says that to me, like I I ask, well, how old were they? Because remember the middle school magic. You have to be really careful because people will say, you know, oh, I tried this like vision therapy thing, which dyslexia is not vision based, right? It's processing. And they'll be like, oh, I just couldn't believe it. You know, and I'll say, well, how old was, were they? And though they were 12 or 13. And I'm like, that was middle school magic. (laughs) That wasn't the program. So then I think what I might be hearing you say then is that there's a couple ingredients, you know, you need a 
read aloud a lot so that your kids want to read. So they have that motivation to want to get good stories. They need a good systematic reading program that's good for dyslexic learners that works with the way their brain is wired. And then they need time. They just need time. Do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also like, if you have a child that is kind of aware of their, like maybe a younger sibling is reading better than them or Sunday school, they realize, oh my gosh, you know, like these other kids are reading and I can't, I really am a strong believer in acknowledging that they're dyslexic. I wrote a children's book on it as well, because if you don't tell a kid that there's a reason why they're struggling, they're going to assume what everybody else is assuming, that they're not very smart. And that's a rotten way to grow up, you know, and, and just explaining what it is and then explaining to them the strengths. And then if you're a Christian, like for my kids, I've told them you were created by God with a purpose. I know that there have got to be listeners today who are listening, thinking, oh my goodness, I there are so many things in my head, you know, so many things are bells are ringing for them as far as what might be happening in their child's reading life, their child's learning life. And one of the things that was discouraging to me at the beginning of learning about dyslexia was finding out that, you know, it's quote unquote best for a dyslexic child to be remediated or get that systematic reading instruction that's really good for dyslexic kids starting at a young age. But what about those who are listening who have kids who are 12 or 14 or 15 and their parents are realizing, oh, I think you might need to learn a different way. What do you have to say for them? Is it is it too late? You know, did they mess it up? <laughs> no. So so there's a couple points. Let me just one is if you feel like they need remediation. You know, if you feel like their reading and spelling is still not, it still needs help. There is, you could hire a tutor. You could do something like all about reading. I recommend this program called Reading Horizons. It's an online Orton Gillingham program. And they have two levels, one for kids, I think four to nine and one for 10 and up. The one for 10 and up is gold. It's like, there's a lot of people that like teaching textbooks. It's like teaching textbooks for reading. It's just systematic. There's no bunny rabbits and butterflies, you know, it's just black and white, systematic. And I often run my my kids through there once they've learned to read. I'll just run them through and they learn all the rules. So so you can remediate an older child and you can offer them accommodations, which are things like audiobooks. It's things like assistive technology where they can speak their papers or you can scribe for them. You know, under, it's never, ever too late. Like if you realize that your child has been struggling because of dyslexia, learn about it together. Like it's part of school, right? Just start telling them about what dyslexia is and the famous dyslexics, like you were mentioning, and give them the support that they need. My one son, who's profoundly dyslexic, the older one, he was doing his Eagle Scout project. And he would come to me because it was a lot of paperwork. And he was like, mom, you know, can you help me with this? And I'm like, look, bud, if you're going to be an Eagle Scout, you need to do your own, <laughs> your own notebook. <laughs> <laughs> and his tutor was like, oh, my goodness, you know, and, and she was like helping him to fill out all this paperwork. And, you know, I came to learn later that all of the kids who got Eagle Scout, all of their parents helped them with the paperwork, whether they were dyslexic <laughs> or not. And I was like, oh, so you really cannot help a kid too much. When they don't want help, believe me, they're going to tell you they don't want any help, right? Um, <laughs> That's true. So I would rather err on the side of helping too much as, a, as opposed to not helping enough and leaving them stranded. You know what I mean? And that's always, isn't that like the struggle of homeschooling? <laughs> it's like, am I doing too much and enabling them to be lazy? Or, uh, but with kids with dyslexia, you know, if they need help, I would definitely help them. And just oftentimes writing can be difficult for older dyslexic kids. It's, they might have all the ideas and stuff, but it's actually getting it out of their head onto paper, sometimes called dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is a really, it's like difficulty with writing and it could be due to small motor issues. It could be due to large motor issues, but a lot of times it's just processing. It's that language processing. It's trying to get the words out of the brain and onto paper. And so a lot of times, like a graphic organizer or a web, you know, the web, wheel, the wheels, idea wheels or whatever, those kinds of visuals, tools can be really helpful for older kids. 
But again, you know, using a writing program that's systematic, which, you know, many are, you know, you have the brainstorming stage and then you have the outlining stage and then you build a thesis and, you know, just teaching them systematically and using the same system over and over. I kind of apply the Orton Gillingham principles of teaching reading to other subjects so that you're just breaking things down into little pieces and teaching each specific thing and letting them get good at it. So like my kids did IEW for years. And at the beginning, I would do like write everything. Basically, I'd write the outlines like they would say, so they're just, they're telling it to you and you're tell. writing it for mm-hmm. them. Yes. And then I yes. would type their papers and then gradually I would have them speak their papers and then they got better at typing and then they would type them. And then I'd have them do the outlines themselves. And, you know, I gradually released more responsibility to them as they were ready. And like those kids are great writers now. It's so fun. Okay. So you mentioned two things in there uh, that you can't help your child too much, which I think is a really a watershed idea for homeschooling parents to hold on to because, <laughs> because we tend to think that we're doing our kids a disservice when we're helping them. But Andrew Pudua, speaking of IEW, the founder of IEW, once told a story about how he was at a school doing a writing training and one of the students you know, wasn't writing and Andrew's walking around the room because they're supposed to be, I don't know, brainstorming or whatever. I don't, I'm not sure what phase they were in, what stage they were in, in the program. But anyway, a student raises his hand and says, I just, I don't know what to write. And so Andrew tells him, oh, okay, write this and tells him what to write. And the teacher who was in the room said, you can't do that. You're doing his work for him. And Andrew said, well, I'm here to teach him to write. So now I'm teaching him how to write. I'm teaching him what to write. That's how, (laughs) that's what it is. It's so, it's, in our head, we kind of thought that too, right? Like the first time I heard that story, I thought, well, you can't do the work for him. And then you realize what is teaching? We're modeling. We're showing them what to do. You're getting the kindling <laughs> going, you know, like yeah, you gotta get yeah. the kindling going so that the rest of the fire can go and whatever it takes, kind of like the birds and the bees, you know, I just give them a little bit at a time. Like, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> if they're asking, I'll keep telling, but I, like, I don't give too much away at first, you know, I just kind of wait until they ask. So good. Well, we're going to dive in again in the next episode. Before we do, what is just your one takeaway for parents from this episode who are listening and thinking, okay, what's the first step? I'm going to tell you that your takeaway should be to go read (laughs) Marianne's book, (laughs) Dyslexia 101. We'll have a link in the show notes. You can find it online. Marianne, what what would you like to say? I I would really say to get educated. Really, I think getting educated about dyslexia is so important because our kids are really bright and they have a lot of potential and we don't want to waste a lot of time and energy trying to pound them into these square pegs, so to speak, into a round hole. Understanding how they learn, understanding their strengths, and you know your kid better than anybody. So you're totally way ahead of the game. Now it's time to hear from the kids. They'll tell us about the books they've been loving lately. Hi everybody, my name's Bryce and I live from Arkansas. And my books that I like are called Honey of a Pat's Camp and The Clinic Love and and I'm 10 years old. My name is Benjamin and I'm six. I'm six and a half, and I live in Washington, and I was born in Oregon, and my favorite book is The Twits, and it's illustrated by Quentin Blick, and it's written by Rodal. Why do you like it? Because it's funny. My name is Celestia, and I'm 10 years old, and I live in Washington, and my favorite book is Fable Haven because it's written by Brandon Mole and my, I like it because there's lots of magic and adventures. Hi, my name is Sophia. I am four years old and I live in Ohio. My favorite book is the dolly book, The Best Love Doll, because I like the dollies. Hi, my name is Molly. I'm 12 years old and I live in Maine. My favorite book is Little Women 
I like it so much because all four girls relate to me. Hi, my name's Kirino, and I'm nine years old, and I live in Maine, and my favorite book is the Harry Potter series, and I like it because there's a lot of action in it. Hi, my name is Ryder, and I'm five years old, and I live in Maine, and my favorite book is Fortunately, and the author's name is Remy Sharlip, and why I like it is because he runs away from the tigers. I'm Alisa, and I'm 10 years old. The book I want to recommend is Amos Fortune Freeman. I like and recommend this book because it shows courage and love. And it also shows how God created everyone and they are all important to him. In his life, Amos Fortune faces hardships, and yet he has joyful moments too. He saves many close friends, and even though some died, they died after knowing freedom. And this book is written of a free boy who is captured and then freed again. Amos Fortune's dream of being free came true. My name is Nolan, and I am five years old. I live in California, and my favorite book is called Dragons Love Tacos. Hi, my name is Grady. My age is eight, and I live in Wisconsin. And my favorite book is The Saturdays. I like it because they're doing unique things like going on adventures in the woods and like all these kinds of different adventures. And that's why I like it. Thank you, thank you, kids. Wonderful as always. Hey, if this episode rang some bells for you and you're feeling like you need to hear more, I highly recommend Marianne's website, homeschoolingwithdyslexia.com and go ahead and do yourself a favor and just pick up her book, Dyslexia 101. I read it in an hour or two, I think. I mean, it's a very quick read and that's why I think it's the best first place to go. It's going to do a couple things for you. It's going to give you that confirmation that either what you're looking at or thinking about in your own kids is dyslexia or isn't. And it's also going to be really encouraging. And I felt like, okay, after I read it, it was one of the first times I finished a dyslexia resource and thought, okay, I am so all in on this and we are going to help our kids thrive. And dyslexia is a gift that they have been uniquely gifted with in order to do their work in the world. So Dyslexia 101 by Marianne Sunderland. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. You can pick it up on Amazon and of course her website, like I mentioned, homeschoolingwithdyslexia.com. Now, speaking of homeschooling with dyslexia, on the very next episode, I've invited Marianne back to talk with us about specifically homeschooling dyslexic kids. Because like I said, seven out of her eight kids are dyslexic. She homeschooled them. And I really wanted to get to some practical nitty gritty details on the best ways to homeschool our kids who are dyslexic. So she's coming on the next episode, episode 176. That'll drop in your podcast app or right here in your email, depending on where you're listening. And until then... You know what to do in the meantime, right? (laughs) Go make meaningful and lasting connections with your kids through books. So many of us feel overwhelmed in our homeschool. There's a lot to do, and it feels like every child needs something a little different. The good news is you are the best person on the planet to help your kids learn and grow. And home is the best place to fall in love with books. I'm Sarah McKenzie. I'm a homeschooling mother of six, the author of Teaching from Rest and the Read Aloud family. And I'm the host here on the Read Aloud Revival podcast. This podcast has been downloaded over 8 million times. And you know, I think it's because so many of us want the same things. We want our kids to be readers, to love reading. We want our homes to be warm and happy havens of learning and connection. We know that raising our kids is the most important work of our lives. That's kind of overwhelming, right? You are not alone. In Read Aloud Revival Premium, we offer family book clubs, a vibrant community, and Circle with Sarah, 
coaching for you, the homeschooling mom, so you can teach from rest, homeschool with confidence, and raise kids who love to read. Our family book clubs are a game changer for your kids' relationship with books. We provide you with a family book club guide and an opportunity for your kids to meet the author or illustrator live on screen. So all you have to do is get the book, read it with your kids, and make those meaningful and lasting connections. They work for all ages, from your youngest kids to your teens. Every month, our community also gathers online for a circle with Sarah to get ideas and encouragement around creating the homeschooling life you crave. They're the most effective way I know to teach from rest and build a homeschool life you love. We want to help your kids fall in love with books, and we want to help you fall in love with homeschooling. Join us today at rarpremium.com.